Let us hear now from the Gospel of John as we hear the resurrection story. Let us hear the word of God. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. And at this she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said this. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. May God, the Father, who inspired these words and who has preserved them and who has ordained that they be proclaimed today. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be glorified on this resurrection day. Please pray with me. Lord, I want my words to be your words. I want my message to be your message. Lord, may we really pay attention to the word that you have for us today. In Christ we pray. Amen. The title of my message is, I Want to Live Again. Many of you know the story of It's a Wonderful Life. How George Bailey grew up in Bedford Falls He had a younger brother named uh, Harry, and his father owned a hardware store in town and was also the president of uh, the building and loan. The plan was that after Harry finished college, 
that George would go off to school. However, his father passed away. And when Harry returned from college, he brought back with him a new wife. And the wife had mentioned to George Bailey that her father had offered Harry a wonderful job in Buffalo, New York. George, not wanting to get in the way of his younger brother Harry's success, agreed to stay on at the building and loan and run it. As the story progresses, there is an absent-minded uncle named Uncle Billy. It was around the holidays and the bank examiner was coming to do an audit. And the day that Uncle Billy went to the bank, he put $5,000 in a newspaper. And as he went into the bank, he saw Mr. Potter, the meanest guy in town, who was seeking to get his hands on every business and he took advantage of people. Uncle Billy, without realizing it, with the 5000 inside the newspaper, handed Mr. Potter the newspaper, went up to the bank to make the deposit, to which the woman said, aren't you forgetting something? And he said, no. And she said, well, it's usually the custom to bring the money that you're going to deposit to the bank. He was not able to find the money. Mr. Potter kept it. And they searched diligently all day and for days looking for this money. Meanwhile, the bank examiner was waiting to audit the books. George knew that there was going to be big trouble. He knew there would be scandal. He knew that he might even go to prison. And in his depression and discouragement, around Christmas decides that he's going to take his own life. But there is an angel that is sent from heaven named Clarence and Clarence actually jumps into the water before George does knowing that George being a kind-hearted man would jump in and save him. George finds out that an angel had been sent to help him. And the angel said to him, how foolish of you to think about throwing away your life. To which George said, I'm more for death than I am alive. And the angel said, you shouldn't say that. And so the plan was to get George Bailey to see how such a wonderful life that he can live. And so the angel made it so that the world would live as if your family had never been born. And he was able to see in his life how he had an impact on other people. And he went back and of course he wasn't married, he didn't have any kids. His mother didn't know because he didn't have them. Nobody in town knew that. And so the scene that I'm going to show you the next two minutes is the, one, one of the final scenes of the movie where George comes to the conclusion that he had a wonderful life. And so he is praying that he should be able to return to Victor Paul. Can you that up a little bit? One, please. Get me back! Get me back! I don't care what happens to me! Get me back to my wife and kids! Help me, Clarence, please! Please! I want to live again! I want to live again! I want to live again! Please, God, let me live again! <laughs> Hey, George! George! You all right? Hey, what's the matter? Now get out of here, Bert, I'll hit you again. Get out! What's the Sam Hill you yelling for, George? Get... George? Bert, you know me? Know you? <laughs> you kidding? I've been looking all over town trying to find you. I saw your car piled into that tree down there, and I thought maybe you... 
Hey, your mouth's bleeding. Is you sure you're all right? What did you <laughs> My mouth's bleeding, Bert! My mouth's bleeding! Do 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 It's a wonderful movie for times when we feel discouraged or depressed. It's one of the best movies ever. Um, the story is told of this evangelist who was preaching one day about going to heaven. And at the beginning of his message, he talked about going to heaven. And about a third of the way through the message, he said, How many of you want to go to heaven? Raise your hand. And about a third of the people raised their hand. And he preached the Lord. And he said, How many people want to go to heaven? And about two-thirds of people went to heaven, said they wanted to go to heaven. Finally, at the end of the service, he kept asking that question over and over again, and everybody said they wanted to go to heaven, except one person in the back. And so he concluded the service, and he said to the question, would you tell that young man to come into my office? I'd like to speak with him. And so he came into the pastor's office, and the pastor said, I talked about wanting to go to heaven today, he said, everybody else said they wanted to go to heaven. Why didn't you raise your hand? And the young man said, well, Pastor, the way you were preaching and getting all excited, I thought you wanted me to go right now. <laughs> what if Paul, in the 15th chapter of First Timothy, paints a gloomy scenario, what if Jesus had not been raised? From the dead. You know, a lot of us have come in what if. Thank you. Have you ever wondered what it would be like if you were born somewhere else in the world? How your life would be different? Have you ever wondered what it would be like if you came from a different family? Now, some of you may be saying, you know, maybe that was a family. But we don't think about these things. What if Christ is not risen? What a terrible thought. If Christ is not risen, Paul says, we are still dead in our trespasses and sins. We are still guilty before God the Father. Without the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we would be guilty. We would be condemned to hell as a result of God's wrath upon our sin and our disobedience. Years ago, a teacher was sent to a hospital where a young student had been severely burned. And the teacher did not want the student to fall behind. And he really was not doing very well in school. And so there was a substitute teacher that went in, went into the hospital to see this young boy, and she was to talk to him about adverbs and verbs and things like that. And when she entered the room, she noticed the boy was very sick. And she hesitated even going in, but she went in. And the nurse had told her before she went in that the last day she had not been doing very well. The next day, when the teacher returned, the nurse stopped him at the station and said to her, Ma'am, what did you do to that little boy? And he thought he was in trouble. And he said, What do you what do you, she said, What do you mean? And the nurse said, You know, after you left yesterday the floor was worked up, and then the last twenty four hours was made the money was picked up. His whole attitude was later after the boy recovered. little boy was asked what he was thinking when he was in the hospital. And he really thought he was going to die. And then he made this statement. I thought I was going to die until the day the teacher came in to visit him. And he said, you know, if people believe that teaching me things if they believe in the teacher, they believe that that teacher is good for me. I believe there is hope. Because they wouldn't send a teacher to see a boy to the child. 
we have hope. Jesus would not have come to earth. God the Father would not have sent the Son to earth if you were not of value to them. We love because God first loved us. We cannot separate the message of the cross from the message of the angels. Following his resurrection, Jesus appeared many, many times to many different people. On one appearance, he appeared to more than 500 people at one time. On the road to Emmaus, that first Easter, Jesus revealed himself to two of his followers. And from Jerusalem to Emmaus is about seven miles. And you remember the story. When they got to Emmaus, Jesus was going to go farther along, and they said, no, it's getting away from the day. And Jesus had communion. And the disciples just recognized it was Jesus in the breaking of bread. And they were so excited. And remember, this was where this evening. They had only traveled seven miles from the new world to the mayor. And following their encounter with Jesus, they turned around, and they looked back to Jerusalem and Jesus Christ had fully risen from the grave. We deal with a lot of fears in our lives. So some of us have a fear of failure. Some of us, particularly during this time of COVID, can think about many people alone in isolation. The fear of that thing. The fear of loneliness, not being able to engage with family members and friends and neighbors. We live through life having a fear of rejection. You know doctors tell us that when you meet somebody for the first time and when they say you know, you don't do that much in your own heart, but you know doctors have said that when you meet somebody and you shake hands with them, that for most of us, our blood pressure goes up a little bit. Because there is this fear of, you know, what is this person going to think of? We have many, many fears. And then finally, there is the fear of God. It's, it's common to everything. Jesus came that he may have life and have it to all. And because he lives, we will live and see Jesus come back. Doctors have identified at least 527 different types of fears and categories of fears. And a number of years ago, there was a study of 500 people. And they were asked to list their fears. 500 people sat down and they wrote a list. Guess how many they came up with? More than 7,000 years. We live in a fearful world. But Jesus came that we might have heart. Fear not, Abraham told fear not. Someone once calculated there are approximately 365 fear not in the Bible, one for every day. To Isaac and Jacob, when the angel appeared to them, they were called fear not. When Mary was approached by the angel Gabriel to be told to be the mother of our Jesus, of our Lord, the angel said to her, Fear not. To Zachariah, when he was told that Elizabeth was going to have a baby, he was called fear not. The shepherds out in the field that night, when the angel appeared to them, before our Lord was born. Remember when the disciples were in the storm in their boat. Jesus said, Fear not. And finally, that first Easter morning, when the women and the disciples came and they saw the angels, when the first thing the angel said to them is, Fear not. Fear not. God came into the world in Jesus Christ. He conquered death so that we. I want to conclude by sharing a story with you. It is the story of Edith Burns. Edith Burns was a wonderful Christian who lived in San Antonio, Texas. She was the patient of a doctor by the name of Dr. Will Phillips. And Dr. Phillips was a nice, gentle, personable doctor. 
and he saw many patients, but his favorite patient was Edith Burns. One morning, he went to his office with a heavy heart, and it was because of Edith Burns. And when he walked into the waiting room, there sat Edith with her big black Bible in her lap, earnestly talking to a young mother sitting beside her. And whenever Edith would meet someone, this was her introduction. Hello, I'm Edith Burns. Do you believe in Easter? Then she would explain the meaning of Easter, and many people entered the kingdom of God as a result of her love for them. Dr. Phillips walked into the office, and there he saw the head nurse, Beverly, and Edith was going to be seen by the doctor, but the doctor said to Beverly, just wait a few more minutes. There's a spiritual birth that's about ready to happen out there in the waiting room. Edith kept pressing the woman about the meaning of Easter and finally it led her to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So after being called back into the doctor's office, Edith sat down and when she took took a look at the doctor's face, she said, Dr. Will, why are you so sad? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? And Dr. Phillips said gently, Edith, I'm the doctor. You're the patient. And with a heavy heart, he said to her, your lab report came back. It is confirmed that you have cancer. And Edith, you're not going to live very long. Edith said, Why, Dr. Phillips, shame on you. Why are you so sad? Do you think God makes mistakes? You have just told me that I'm going to see my precious Lord Jesus, my husband and my friend. You have just told me that I'm going to celebrate Easter forever. And here you are having difficulty giving me my ticket. Dr. Phillips thought to himself, what a magnificent woman this Edith Burns. Well, Edith continued to come to Dr. Phillips and Christmas time came and the doctor's office was closed because of the holidays. And on January 3rd, the office received a call from Edith. She said she would be moving her story to the hospital. She said, Dr. Phillips, I'm very near home, so would you make sure that the people that they put in my room at the hospital who need to know about Easter, would you please make sure they come to my room? And they did exactly that. Many people came and left during those weeks as Edith was used by God to bring them into the kingdom of God. Every person in the hospital, from their staff to the people who cleaned to the people who brought food, knew about Edith. And after a while, they started to call her Edith Easter. That was her nickname. Everyone called her that except the head nurse, Florence. Florence made it very plain that she wanted nothing to do with Edith because, quite frankly, she thought Edith was a religious nut. She had been a nurse in the hospital. She had seen it all. She had been married three times. She was very hard, very cold. She did everything by the book. And one morning, when one of the nurses who was to attend to Edith was out sick, Florence had to go in to give her her shot. And when she walked in, Edith had a big smile on her face, and she said, Florence, God loves you, and I love you, and I'm praying for you. I've been praying for you. Florence says, well, you can quit praying for me. It won't work. I'm not interested. Well, I will pray, and I've asked God not to let me go home until you come into the family. And Florence says, well, then you're going to never die because that's never going to happen. And she abruptly walked out of the room. Every day, Florence would walk into the room, and Edith would say, God loves you, Florence, and I love you. 
and I've been praying for you. One day, Phyllis was drawn into the room of Edith like a magnet. She sat down on the bed and Edith said, I'm so glad you have come because God told me today is your special day. <clears throat> Florence said, Edith, you have asked everyone here the question, do you believe in Easter? But you know, you've never asked me. Eva said, Florence, I wanted to many times, but God told me to wait until you asked, and now you have asked. And so Edith took out her Bible, and she shared with Florence the Easter story of the death and burial and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Jesus looked at Florence and said, Florence, do you believe in Easter? Do you believe that Jesus is alive and that he wants to live in your heart? Tears began to stream down Florence's face. And she said, oh, I want to believe that with all my heart. And right there, at that moment, Florence accepted Jesus Christ into her life as Lord and Savior. Two days later, Florence came in and said to Edith, do you know what day it is? Why, Edith, it's Good Friday. And Edith said, oh no, every day is Easter. Happy Easter, Florence. Two days later, on Easter Sunday, Florence came into work, did some of her duties, and then she took a walk by the shop in the hospital. She was going to pick up some Easter lilies to bring to Edith. And when she walked into Edith's room, Edith was in bed. She had a big black Bible on her lap. She had a smile on her face. But when Florence felt her, her hands were cold. She had died. Her left hand was on John chapter 14. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Florence took one look at Edith and then lifted her face toward heaven. And with tears streaming down her eyes, she said, Happy Easter, Edith. Happy Easter. She walked out of the room. She went over to a table where there were two stu student nurses who were sitting. And she sat down and she introduced herself to them and she said, my name is Phyllis Cross. Do you believe in Easter? May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be worshipped and glorified and magnified and serve each day that we have breath. Amen.